Welcome back, crew. It's March, and that means we are diving into the Fabula Ultima Tabletop JRPG as our game of the month. And today, we're going to be going through the core mechanics of the system, kind of putting the, the system through what makes it tick and showing you how to run the adventuring aspects of Fabula Ultima. We're dividing it in two, though. So today, we're doing the adventuring aspects of core, how to make a check, how to handle scenes, how to uh, kind of resolve the, the invoking of traits and bonds. Uh, and then Wednesday, we're going to be going through and doing the combat aspects, showing you how to start combat with initiative, how to handle uh, attacks, damage, resting, and everything that goes along with it. Uh, and then Thursday, we are diving in with our live actual play of the system. So Thursday, March 28th at 7 p.m., we're going to be putting uh, Fabula Ultima through its paces, uh, as well as raffling off a free PDF copy of the RPG to one lucky viewer. So make sure you guys come through and get a chance to first see the system and uh, get all of its glory. Uh, and hopefully you'll hit that in that 20 and get a chance to be able to bring the system home for you and your crew. But yeah, let's dive in. So with this system, I think it's a, before we dive into it as a whole, I think kind of for mechanical classifications, I've put it as a balanced system. Uh, it definitely has some crunch behind it, but it's not overly crunchy. It's not going to be one that's going to, uh, where you have to have the book constantly open, uh, but it is going to take a little bit to get into the flow of the system. Uh, we're going to do a full kind of dive into that during our review, but we're going to give a little sneak peek on that side. So let's start off with the game rules. Uh, the first piece we are going to hit kind of lightly is scenes. Uh, this section, if you've run an RPG, if you played an RPG before, uh, you're going to be very familiar with this. It just gives some great uh, advice for new players and new GMs for, for how to frame the scene and set it up, uh, as well as for players, how to interact with the scene and kind of how to close a scene out. Uh, for these, if you're new, this is, I highly recommend it. They laid it out in a very nice way. Uh, if you're an old hand at RPGs, you probably don't need that information. Uh, this part we're going to kind of focus on for a second are the three scenes they really call out. Uh, the first one, conflict scenes. We're going to dive into that pretty heavily during Wednesday, but these are going to be the battle scenes where you're going through and having some type of conflict that you're trying to resolve there utilizing the system's conflict rules. Uh, the next one are interlude scenes. These are kind of like a more slower task where they're minute by minute or second by second. Uh, timing doesn't matter. These are ones that'd be great for downtime, searches, uh, long marches. These are ones you can kind of zoom out and get like a, a larger picture, uh, kind of what the player is trying to accomplish or trying to do. And then finally, this is kind of a cool one. Um, this is something I've never really done in our or tabletop RPG. Uh, this is the Game Master scenes. And this is something if you play like a lot of like the old JRPGs, like Final Fantasy, uh, Dragon Age, or not Dragon Age, uh, Dragon Quest, there we go. Uh, you've seen this a lot before where you get to see kind of a little cut scene and you get to see what the villains are doing. Uh, these are great for kind of a wrapping up tension, uh, but I've never really used them in a tabletop RPG before because one of the things you'll note is the uh, players will be spectators in the scene. Uh, this is going to be most of the GMs kind of uh, kind of giving some cool behind the scene peeks of what the villains are doing, but their characters won't know. Uh, so it'd be kind of cool to test that out with this system. Uh, kind of, Cards of table a little worried that kind of the player's involvement, or lack of involvement, I should say, on that side, and kind of the potential for metagaming, but I think it'd be kind of cool, on the other hand, for kind of wrapping up tension, kind of giving that behind the sneak, uh, the scene sneak peek, uh, and kind of getting people a little bit, uh, kind of setting the stakes as well. So I'm kind of curious to see how that plays out, what my players think of the scenes afterwards as well. So this also gives some cool information for sessions, campaigns, and all of that. Uh, if you're used to kind of running an RPG, I think you can skip that, and we are going to skip that today uh, and get into the meat of the system, how to make checks. Uh, and this is pretty, uh, pretty straightforward on that side. So with the system, uh, you can go through. Uh, checks are always going to require two die. It's always going to be a mixture of uh, of two attributes, and uh, let me clarify there too. It could even be the same attribute sometimes. Sometimes it may be a might and might check. Uh, and with this system, if you watched our character creation, each of these attributes are going to have a dice associated with them. Uh, so it could be uh, if you're a starting character, anywhere from a d10 to a d6 uh, on that side. Uh, so uh, you could go through and get to kind of pick what makes sense for the characters of the game master to roll in that scene uh and you'll be able to kind of go through and build out kind of your dice pool for the system uh so 
with that too. Uh, there's a couple of rules that go along with this. So this gives you some good information for kind of how to handle or when to make a roll and when not to make a roll. Uh, pretty standard fare on that side. Make sure your players are heroes. So if it's something mundane or something that doesn't add attention to the story, skip it. If it's something that they should reasonably be able to do with their background skill set, skip it. Uh, really kind of make sure you're doing roles that keep the tension high uh, and keep the, the story moving forward. Uh, so with that, that's going to give us a breakdown of what's going to be included in the role. Uh, so typically, it's just going to be your two attributes. Uh, so for the example they provide there, dex plus might. Uh, but you can also add in uh, modifiers. They have this on another page uh, where you can get those situation modifiers. Uh, unless it comes from a skill or something that the player has done, it's typically going to be them something in like a, a very advantageous or disadvantageous system or kind of a moment there. Uh, and the game master can add a plus or minus two to their role. Uh, but sometimes abilities and uh, skills are able to allow them to add that to their role too. So basically, uh, you make the roll, you add, you add or modif uh, minus your modifier there, uh, and the game master sets the difficulty level. Uh, so with that, uh, there's a spot where you're two where you'll see a little bit ahead where you see the difficulty level table, uh, where it kind of gives the, the typical difficulty levels that a game master should be utilizing when running an adventure. But before we dive into that, this system does utilize their base rules, crit successes, as well as fumbles. And this system, crit successes work a little bit different. So uh, you'll get a crit success if you roll the same number on both of your die uh, with a six or above on the die rolls. Uh, so if you get a double six, seven, all the way up to 12, you could be able to bust those out and get a crit success. Uh, what that allows you to do is you automatically succeed at whatever you are going for, uh, but you also get an opportunity that you can invoke and you'll see on the next page the opportunity table and kind of what that all entails. So fumbles, fairly similar, but they're gonna be doubles on the ones. So if you roll two ones, uh, you're going to fumble. Uh, and kind of very similar to that, you're gonna automatically fail whatever you were trying to do. The dice roll probably would've made you fail either way, uh, but it also gives whoever is your opposition or controlling your opposition, whether if you're going up against one of the NPCs, the GM would get the fumble or the, the opportunity there, uh, or if you're going up against another player character for something, uh, that player character would get an opportunity that they could invoke as well. Also cool thing, when you do fumble, uh, you get a, a Beulah point, which we'll go into in a second, uh, which allows you to do some cool things like invoking traits and bonds. Uh, but yeah, you see with the opportunity, you get a table that you can pick from and kind of decide what makes sense for you in this moment. Uh, with this, uh, the GM has to approve the opportunity as well, uh, but you can kind of go through and decide whether if you want to get an advantage, which allow you or an ally to receive a four bonus on your next roll, uh, affliction, the creature suffers days, shaken. Uh, you kind of go through and see which fits the narrative best, collaborate with the game master, and they can bring this into the fiction. Uh, but, uh, and also on the flip side too, your game master, if you uh, fumble against the enemy, can bring one of these to bear uh, for their person or against you as well. So, fairly similar on that side. So we've went through kind of the attribute checks. Uh, we've went through kind of how to handle the, uh, the the difficulty levels, but let's take a look at the table there. So with this one, it's a dice pool system. So, you know, the numbers are going to be pretty straightforward because uh, you're typically get on your average roll. It's just going to be those dice pools uh, with modifiers occasionally being added in. So with this set, uh, seven is going to be an easy check. So most people should be able to do so. Uh, the typical check for with this is 10, and they kind of recommend if you're not sure about something, go with 10. Uh, and then you can go all the way up to a 16 for something that's really only going to be able to be done by the best in the field with probably some prep and some circumstances, some aid from their allies as well. So before we dive into the next piece, we're going to go back a little bit and take a look at bonds. Yeah, I think the bonds are kind of a cool piece that need to be referenced here, especially before we get into the evoking a trait and bonds section, uh, which will be next. Uh, so with this, bonds are going to be between three categories of six emotions. You can have up to six bonds with different people, uh, and with those bonds, you can have three of the emotions, one from each category within a bond. Uh, bonds, as you see, we're going to see later, can be invoked. Uh, you could use that to kind of add to your roles. Uh, but before you do that, you need to kind of know what bonds are and how to build them with other PCs and other characters as well. Uh, so you see there's three categories. You've got admiration, inferiority, loyalty, mistrust, affection, hatred. 
Uh, and you can have up to three of these with one person, but it's always one from each category. So you could admire somebody, but mistrust them, but still feel affection for them. But you could admire somebody and feel inferior to them at the same time. Uh, and with that, too, uh, we can kind of go through. We're going to go through the next stage to kind of show you what bonds are in a little bit more detail, uh, as well as how to create them. Uh, so this gives you kind of a run through there. They're pretty self-explanatory, but in case you had some questions on kind of what these mean and kind of what mistrust, how that would operate, how you'd play that out in the RP. Uh, but this gives you a little bit more of the rules here with the pairings and all of that. The piece I wanted to focus on was how to create a bond because they're kind of an important part of the system and definitely one you want to kind of employ to its fullest. Uh, so with this, you can usually do this during resting scenes, which we're going to cover in our combat video. Uh, through opportunities, you saw through the opportunity list, there's some opportunities that will allow you to create a bond with a creature, uh, as well as specific skills will allow you to go through and create a bond uh, that you can bring to bear. As we remember though, uh, and with these two, you'll start off with one emotion, you can go through and strengthen them up to three. Uh, and those are typically being done during rest scenes too, which we'll cover during our combat video. Uh, with that though, uh, you could only have six bonds. You could just erase a bond if you need to, if you gain another one and no longer need one of the old ones. And one of the cool things I thought they included on this as well, uh, bonds are stronger than death. So even if you have a PC who you had a strong bond with and unfortunately they fell to one of the bad, big bad evil guys, uh, you could still invoke that bond and still get strength from that bond, which I thought was kind of a cool fact that they brought in there. But now that we know that what bonds are, uh, we're going to show you how to invoke a trait as well as a bond. So let's dive into that. So with this, very easy. Uh, we, uh, we went over how fumbles give you Fabula Ultima points. Uh, so these points can be utilized uh, when you need to to invoke a trait or a bond, which will help you to uh, potentially succeed on a roll. Uh, so with that, uh, if you invoke a fibula point, you can re-roll one to two of the dice that you rolled, uh, and you can utilize the, the, you have to utilize the new result on the dice. Uh, so with that, it allows you uh, to invoke one of your traits. So this could be your identity, your origin, your theme. Check out the character creation video for a little bit more on that side. Uh, but let's say, let's use their instance for the Shadow Knight, uh, that their identity is the Gaonia Empire. Uh, they could say, hey, uh, there's something related to the Empire, there's something related to this that kind of truly uh, makes sure that I should have a better chance of succeeding. Uh, if the Game Master approves, uh, they spin that Fibula point, uh, and then they re-roll uh, one to two of those dice and get to determine uh, with those new dice if they beat the difficulty level, or so if they succeeded or fail. So pretty straightforward on that side. Biggest thing is you can invoke a trait if you fumbled the check. So if you rolled two nat ones, unfortunately that is part of the fiction already. You can't kind of go back on that side. Fairly straightforward. Uh, and then give some advice too as well, just to make sure that you're playing out your characters for kind of invoking their, their traits, their origins, their, uh, their themes, to make sure that you're kind of RPing it fairly and not trying to get undue advantage or try to almost play your character out of a character to get some extra advantage. So bonds, very similar. You have to spend a fibula point, uh, but with these, rather than re-rolling a dice, you can invoke the strength of your bond to be able to add it to the rolling. So let's say one of your player, or one of the, the PCs in your party, uh, you uh, admire them, you're affectionate towards them, but you still mistrust them. You've got that plus three in the bond. You've rolled your dice, you've gotten a six, uh, but you just need a couple more points to succeed. You can spend that fibula point, add the three from your strength of the bond to that dice roll of six, putting you at a nine, which will hopefully help you succeed to beat that difficulty level. Uh, so this is kind of another way, and with both these, I should mention, for both invoking the strength and the bond, these are some great times for your players, or if you are a player, to kind of go through and really kind of see, kind of RP out why that trait, or why that bond really kind of enhances you in that moment. It brings some cool RP scenes to the table. So definitely what I'm looking forward to seeing him play out with my crew, uh, but the one you should kind of keep an eye out for, really kind of see cool scenes you can invoke in, uh, and just to make sure you're both hopefully succeeding, but also kind of adding some cool tension and a cool development to the story. So uh, with that too, uh, checks are pretty much standard across the board. I know we're gonna go with this with our 
uh, with our combat video, but accuracy checks are usually could be uh, dex or insight. It kind of depends on what weapon you're utilizing, what formula you're going to be rolling there. Uh, magic checks are very similar. One thing I'll mention too, we hadn't gone into this as well. Uh, sometimes it'll matter, especially for magic, which dice you roll higher on. Uh, so for instance, if you're making a roll, uh, with uh, your willpower and let's say might, for instance, uh, some spells or some powers may care which dice rolled higher. Uh, so let's say you rolled willpower on that one. You'd want to check that and check your spell, check your attribute, check your power, and kind of see if there's any additional benefit you gain from that one being the higher roll. So keep that in mind. Uh, Oppose checks very easy to work with uh basically they don't have a difficulty level it's going to be kind of you matching up against whoever you're rolling against the higher the score works or wins uh and then uh, with fumbles uh you basically get the lowest possible results uh and then crit successes are the highest possible results so if you rolled for easy numbers let's say you had 2d6 and you rolled a 12 uh that'll be kind of the, the highest possible if you rolled a two uh for any of them pretty much that's gonna be the lowest possible result and then open checks are kind of an interesting one on the open checks. This is one where there's going to be no difficulty level, uh, but it kind of determines kind of how well you do something. So let's say if you were crafting something, I feel like this would be the perfect spot for it. Uh, you could roll that, and your game master is not going to set a difficulty level, but you're going to utilize this table to kind of see how it comes out. So if you roll a 7, like this is kind of an average person. This is average work. Uh, but if you roll a 16, like you basically made something, you crafted a weapon, crafted a something that would be legendary that people will be talking about for years to come. Uh, with this too, we've already went over the situational modifiers. Game Master can add that plus two, minus two, if you've really set yourself up for advantageous situations or in a really rough spot. Typically, they recommend um, utilizing difficulty levels for this, but some scenarios where if the player is really kind of uh, done well or done really poorly, uh, it's good to roll those modifiers in too, just to really show how that impacts the fiction. And then the last thing we're going to touch on today are the group checks. Uh, so with this, it's a little bit of a different process. So if there's going to be a group check, so some, everybody's going to be doing the same thing, uh, whether it be stealthing or the crafting, everybody's chipping into the crafting in some way, or somebody's trying to, uh, everybody's working to convince uh, the king of some nation to uh, lend their army to a battle, you can make it a group check. So the group checks are going to uh, nominate one leader for the check, uh, and then basically everybody else is going to act as a supporting character. Uh, so with that, each of the supporting characters uh, is going to make the same check that the leader will roll, but their DC will always be, or DL, I should say, will always be 10. Uh, and with that, each success that they get is going to allow a plus one bonus to the leader's check. Uh, and if any of these characters have a bond towards a leader, uh, that's also added to the leader's check as well. Uh, we can only add the highest bond. So if they all had a bond to the leader. You only look through and see who has the highest bond on that side. You'd add that bond to the leader's check. Uh, and then once you've got all, all the supporting characters rolled, all the bonds added, the leader will make the check and then compare to the difficulty level the game master set. Uh, and then that's how you go. Uh, so fairly straightforward there, but a cool system for kind of handling those group checks uh, to uh, give us some structure and make sure everybody's not, or, and give a way that everybody could dogpile without it kind of ruining the map. So I, I like that. I'll be cool, curious to see how that one plays out live at the table. But yeah, so that's kind of a quick run through of the adventuring mechanics and how to handle the checks, bonds, invoking traits and bonds uh, within the Fabula Ultima system. We are going to be doing a combat video on Wednesday showing you how to handle the combat aspects as well as resting aspects for the system. So make sure to come by for that. Uh, and definitely make sure to come by for our live actual play of the Fibula Ultima system this Thursday, March 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. If you're coming after the video is posted, check out. We'll have a, a, a the actual play recorded as a VOD on the channel. Definitely make sure to check that out. And for those live viewers, get a chance to win a free copy. Yeah, shout out some of the cool mechanics below, especially if there's anything we didn't cover that you think is good or interesting for the system, shout those out. Uh, and then definitely make sure to come by for a combat video, but thanks for hanging out and till next time.